The preservation of steam locomotives has always been seen as an act to save a part of history and to keep it around for future generations to enjoy and study about. Many locomotives have been saved, with most of them being on display in parks and museums, and some even fortunate enough to be fully restored for running around on the railroad. Or railway. Either way, some of these locomotives have been restored for big excursions on the main line, and others on small tourist lines. But not all specimens of steam have made it into the preservation era. Although quite a lot of classes do live on with one surviving example or more, there are classes with no surviving examples. This video will show some of the extinct classes of steam locomotives from the United Kingdom and the United States that have grabbed my interest the most. And in fairness, it must be noted that quite a few of the British locomotive designs won't remain extinct for much longer. With that out of the way, ranging from glamorous express engines to underrated freight locomotives, this is my top 20 extinct UK and US steam locomotives. Number 20. The London, Midland and Scottish Patriots. Kicking off the list are these three-cylinder 460 10-wheelers designed by Sir Henry Fowler. Between 1930 and 1934, the LMS poured out 52 locomotives at their shops in Crewe and Derby. Initial road numbers were a bit all over the place, since 40 of them took the road numbers of the London and Northwestern's large Clotson 460s, from which they were rebuilt. But beginning in 1934, they were renumbered 5500 through 5551 with the former Clottons having become locomotives 5502 through 5541. Looking at the Patriots themselves, their chassis was based on that of the 6100 class 460s, known as the Royal Scots, but combined with the boiler from the large Clottons. As a result of that, the Patriots were nicknamed Baby Scots. Anyway, 18 of the Patriots were rebuilt between 1946 and 1949, looking more like modern LMS locomotives as a result, with a tapered boiler and a new smoke box. Well, at least a new door. As seen in the images, the Patriots were used on passenger trains. But when the 1960s began, so did the withdrawal of the Patriots. All 52 of them were retired by the end of 1965, and they all bit the dust at the hands of the Cutter's Torch. But hope isn't dead yet. The last Patriot that was built, Locomotive 5551, is being reincarnated in the form of a replica. At the time of this production, the locomotive itself is taking shape, but she obviously needs a boiler. The group hopes to have the reincarnated 5551, to be named the Unknown Warrior, completed by April of 2018. Just make your mind up with the paint job, chaps. Having one side in an LMS red and the other in BR green is silly. Number 19, the Virginian and Erie Triplexes, or Triplexes as it's actually pronounced. Yep, now we're heading to the American side of the big pond, known as the Atlantic Ocean. Kicking off the American side of things are four locomotives built in an enormous gamble. In the 1910s, articulated steam locomotives were starting to make a massive impact on American railroads and the Erie and Virginian railroads knew that they had to go big or go home if they wanted in on the concept of massive locomotives that could haul monstrous freight trains over steep grades. In 1914, the Erie made the first move by purchasing the very first 28882 locomotive from the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Number 5014, briefly named Matt H. Shea, was a locomotive unlike anyone had ever seen before. The boiler had a working pressure of 210 pounds per square inch. And then there was the little fact that it had 24 driving wheels, divided into three sets of eight, with one of those underneath the tender. Later, the 5014 was joined by two sister locomotives, numbers 5015 and 5016, which didn't carry any names. Unfortunately, they didn't perform that well in service. The firebox was too small, with a great area of 90 square feet. It's even been told that the triplexes ran out of steam on Gulf Summit grade, 
with freight trains having to stop for a few minutes to let the boiler pressure on these giants get back up. The firebox was soon enlarged with a great area of 122 square feet. But this didn't stop the other problem, which is pretty obvious if you already think ahead, judging by the pictures of these things. Wheel slippage. As coal and water were used from the tender, the weight on the third set of driving wheels decreased, giving less push on those wheels and making it easier for them to slip. But these locomotives were used in helper service as bankers or pushers, pushing trains from behind, with coal and water readily replenished after each run up the hills. And what about the Virginia Railroad? They ordered only one triplex, number 700. Instead of a 28882, like the Erie triplexes, number 700 was a 28884. But although the Erie used their triplexes with some success, all four of the triplexes were later deemed unsuccessful. By the 1930s, they were gone, with the Erie triplexes broken up for scrap, and the Virginian triplex number 700 getting cut into two separate locomotives. The triplexes were a big gamble and a myth of brute force, but sadly, the myth was busted. Gosh, I miss Mythbusters. Number 18. The Hush Hush. This slightly fat-looking thing had a very unique history behind it. It all started when Nigel Gresley, locomotive designer of the London and Northeastern Railway, was impressed by the usage of high-pressure steam in marine applications. So in 1924, he approached Harold Yarrow, a shipyard owner and marine boilermaker from Glasgow, to ask him if he could design a suitable boiler for a locomotive. The steam locomotive that resulted from this was the one-of-a-kind W1, number 10,000, built in 1929 the only 464 Hudson that was built in the United Kingdom, tank engines not counting. The big catch was that the 10,000 was built with a water tube boiler instead of a more conventional fire tube boiler. This picture right here shows an old black and white photograph of the 10,000's actual boiler, which had a working pressure of 450 pounds per square inch. Yep, yeah, that's definitely high pressure steam right there. And the schematic drawing on the bottom is, well, of a different water tube boiler, but it's just more so to show off how it works. Also, when she was built, she was supposed to be a secret project, which is why it was nicknamed the Hush Hush. But she also got the nickname Galloping Sausage, due to the shape of its original boiler. Speaking of the boiler, it was the big problem with the locomotive. Even with modifications made to it, it never reached the standards of the fire tube boiler, which was conventional for steam locomotives. After being deemed unsuccessful, the Hush Hush got a massive makeover, from the funny thing that she was, to a Hudson version of Gresley's iconic A4 Pacifics. The cylinder layout was also drastically changed, from four cylinders and double expansion to just three cylinders and simple expansion. Now essentially an A4 Pacific with four trailing wheels instead of two, the Hush Hush became much more successful, but more conventional as well. Renumbered into Northeastern 700, not that one, before getting her British Railways road number of 60,700, or however you want to pronounce it, the A4 Hudson was retired from BR's books in June of 1959, and scrapped later that year. It's also worth noting that there were two attempts to give the locomotive an official name. In 1929, when she was built, the 10,000 would have been named British Enterprise, with the nameplates already having been cast. But the plans were cancelled. The same goes for a plan in 1951 to name her Pegasus, albeit without any nameplates made yet. The only thing that survives of the Hush Hush is her British Railway's front number plate. Number 17. The Southern Pacific AC-9s. Going back to the world of American Articulateds, the Southern Pacific was best known here for its cab forwards, especially the modern AC version, used in California and its neighboring states. And we'll get to a specific variant of them later. But they wanted articulated locomotives to pull big freight trains on the southern portion of the railroad too. Very funny. 
in the states of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico? The answer was in the form of the AC-9s, a rather underrated group of two 884 Yellowstones, with 12 examples built, numbered 3800 through 3811, in 1939 by the Lima Locomotive Works in Lima, Ohio. You can see that they were partially streamlined as well, borrowing the smooth cow catcher and the skyline casing from the GS-class Northerns that were often used on the daylight passenger trains. But that bit of glamour is in contrast to the air compressors on the smoke box, which I think is pretty ugly. Anyway, they originally burned coal, but in the 1950s all 12 of them were converted to burn oil, which increased their route availability. Unfortunately, despite this fuel conversion, they couldn't last forever. After diesel locomotives took over the Southwestern Division, and after a final stand on the Modoc line in California and Nevada, these Yellowstones, also nicknamed reverse cab forwards on the SP, were retired between 1953 and 1956, and then sent off to the scrapyard. I'm with Christopher Kovacs on this one, in the sense that I would have liked it if at least one of these was preserved. Yet, yeah, despite the air compressor face, the hints at the GS Northers do give it a bit of glamour that other articulated steam locomotives usually lack. Oh well. Number 16. The LNER U1. More London and Northeastern one-of-a-kind goodness. This time, it's the U1 Garrett, number 2395. Another Grizzly locomotive, this Colossus was built in 1925 but not by the LNER. Instead, it was built by Bayer Peacock and Company, who were best known for building huge amounts of Garrett's for export, particularly to South Africa. When it was put into service, after a bit of moving around to find a suitable location, number 2395 was used as a helper engine, banking heavy trains on the Wasboro Bank. Sorry, having a little bit of difficulty pronouncing that much like the Erie triplexes over Gulf Summit grade. The 2395 itself was adequate, but not successful enough for further development. Indeed, the design suffered some expensive flaws. Being a Gressley locomotive, each set of driving wheels was powered by three steam cylinders, with Walshart's valve gear on the outside and Gressley's conjugated valve gear on the inside. So this thing had six steam cylinders, with two times the rather peculiar maintenance of LNER locomotives in one colossal package. Well, at least Grizzly LNR locomotives. Also, soft water resulted in the boiler being retubed in 1926. Firebox damage was diagnosed in 1927 and 1928, and the locomotive was out of service for nine months during 1930, during which it was fitted with modifications and a new firebox. After this, the loco itself set it down to working its regular beat up and down was brought back, despite continued steaming problems and a definite susceptibility to poor quality coal. Later renumbered to Northeastern 9999 in 1946, she became British Rail 69999 in 1948. It was around this time that further use seemed unlikely with the boiler nearing the end of its working life but in 1949, it was decided that the U1 would be tried on the Leaky Incline on the former LMS route from Bristol to Birmingham as a running mate to Big Bertha, the other banking locomotive already in use there. She's on this list too, so watch out. After a bit of work there and switching between in service and storage at Gorton Locomotive Works, the U1 was retired in 1955 and broken up for scrap in 1956. Number 15, the Pennsylvania Prototype T1 Duplexes. Just to make it clear, this spot is only for the two prototype locomotives of this class. Numbers 6110 and 6111, built by Baldwin in 1941. These two were the only T1 duplexes out of the entire fleet of 52 locomotives that actually worked. At first though, I thought these two were fitted with Walshart's piston valve gear, but during the making of this list, I found out I was wrong on that one. Instead, they were fitted with Franklin Poppet valve gear, which was very finicky in nature, and very difficult and expensive to maintain. And I've even read somewhere that it was poorly assembled, or even made from bad materials. 
Despite this setback for them, these two were still considerably better than the 5500s. The production version of the T1 duplex with 50 locomotives, numbered 5500 through 5549, built in 1945 and 1946. The major advantage of the 6110 and 6111 was that they were built with proper spring equalization. This meant there wasn't an adhesion problem that would result in violent wheel slippage. While the 5500s had faulty spring equalization, making them sliptastic. They were slipping all over the place during startups and at speeds. Back to the two prototypes. The 6110 and 6111 were still a bit of a ball ache during maintenance. But in service they performed very well, having outperformed a 4 unit, 54 horsepower diesel consist at all speeds over 26 miles per hour during testing. They were also quite comfy at pulling 16 car passenger trains at 100 miles per hour. Which is fast enough because with that pump at valve gear, you really don't want to take it to the max. And you really don't want to damage those components and annoy the maintenance crews. Sadly, the 6110 and 6111 joined the controversial 5500s in the fate of being sold for scrap between 1951 and 1952. And all 52 of the T1 duplexes, both the 6110 and 6111 and all the 5500s, have been scrapped by 1956. And before you ask me about the T1 Trust, to keep my answer short and sweet for now, wrong locomotive being built by the wrong people for the wrong reason. The Trust is building a new 5500, numbered 5550, and the main goal of the Trust is to break the world's speed record for steam locomotives, meaning smashing the 126 miles per hour set by Mallard. That's LNER A4 Pacific, number 4468. It's this goal that makes me really hate the T1 Trust, actually. Also, admittedly, because I do have a massive amount of respect for the A4s. But seriously, guys, if somebody from the T1 Trust is actually watching this, please, when your locomotive is built, even if you can perfect the problems, stick with the mainline excursions. Don't break Mallard's record. There are even a few people who support the construction of a new T1, and yet are smart enough to know that breaking the world speed record for steam engines these days is pointless. It just makes you look more like, a, like you're looking for something to brag about to your friends. Be humble. Don't be a cock. Moving on. Number 14. The LMS Turbo Mode. This is the only steam turbine locomotive on the list. And when it comes to British locomotives on the list so far, I have noticed that I'm picking quite a lot of one-off experimental machines. This one is no different. In 1933, William Stanier introduced his Princess Royal Class Pacifics for the London Midland and Scottish Railway, starting with two prototype machines to see how the class would work out. The two engines were number 6200, Princess Royal, and 6201, Princess Elizabeth. Following their success, in 1935, an order of 10 production samples was placed, numbered 6203 through 6212. But prior to those 10 production locomotives, there was a third prototype. It was number 6202. And unlike the previous two Princess Royal Pacifics, and the 10 that would follow, the 6202 used two steam turbines instead of four cylinders. Appropriately enough, it was nicknamed the Turbomotive because of this unique distinction. Steam turbines have always had a mixed reputation as being an ambitious experiment that usually didn't work out that well. But the 6202 proved itself to be quite a successful locomotive regardless of the unconventional mechanics. In fact, she was one of the most successful steam turbines ever built. Again, she was fitted with two turbines, one for forward running, the other one for reverse. With a forward running turbine, the locomotive could produce 2400 horsepower, with the turbine blades spinning at 7060 rotations per minute, giving a decent speed of 62 miles per hour. 
Feeding the steam was a big boiler with the same working steam pressure as that on the proper Princess Royals. 250 pounds per square inch. In 1952, British Railways decided to rebuild number 6202 into a more conventional steam locomotive with steam cylinders, and they officially named her Princess Anne in the process. And yes, of course, being British Rail, they slapped a four in front of her road number to identify her as a, as like an LMS locomotive. She definitely became a proper 462 Pacific. Oddly enough, though, she didn't become a Princess Royal, but a Princess Coronation. The reason why? The cylinder block was a leftover from a Coronation Pacific. Unfortunately, just two months into her new career after her rebirth, the 6202 was destroyed when it pulled the Liverpool and Manchester Express that was involved in the Harrow and Wildstone rail crash. A massive rail disaster that involved three trains. A total of 112 people were killed and 340 people were injured in the accident. After this, the 6202 was taken to Crew Works where it was officially deemed damaged beyond economical repair and broken up for scrap. Part of the engine lived on though as some of the pieces were used in the creation of British Rail's only standard class A Pacific, number 71,000, the Duke of Gloucester, which is currently undergoing a heavy rebuild. Number 13. The LNER J70s. Yes, two UK designs in a row. Booyah! Anyway, these funny looking wooden boxes on wheels began life as the Great Eastern C53s. Between 1903 and 1921, just 12 of these locomotives were made. And part of the reason why it took them so long was because there were five subclasses. You had two actual C-53s made in 1903, then three C-64s made in 1908, a single I-67 in 1910, then three P-75s in 1914, and finally three D-85s in 1921. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. Back to business. These 060 tank engines were used on the Wisbech and Upwell Tramway in East Anglia, built by the GE themselves. No, not General Electric, but Great Eastern. Besides working there as steam trams, they could also be found working at the ports of Great Yarmouth and Ipswich from the 1930s to the 1950s. All of them made it into LNER days, and 11 out of the 12 even made it into BR days. The first withdrawal of this class had already happened in the days of the LNER, in 1942, with the other 11 disappearing more rapidly from BR's books from 1949 to 1955, and all were broken up for scrap. And what chips. And yes, these things did serve as the inspiration for Toby the Tram Engine from Thomas and Friends and whatnot. Now there's a decent replica done up as Toby, but I've outgrown Thomas a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure that Toby thing is a diesel. Number 12. The Baltimore and Ohio EM1s. The B&O was the very first railroad incorporated in the United States on the 4th of July, 1828. It also had quite the impressive motive power, like the B-Class Pacifics, and even the antique locomotive collection, which included number 147, the Thatcher Perkins, and number 25, the William Mason. But the pinnacle of the B&O steam fleet was in the form of their 2884 Yellowstones, designated as the EM once. Baldwin manufactured 30 of them between 1944 and 1945, initially showing up as locomotives 7600 through 7629, they were later renumbered as locomotives 650 through 679. They may have been the BNO's biggest locomotives, but they were also among the smallest size for Yellowstones. But who cares about that? They quickly proved themselves to be technological triumphs in the heavy freight service for which they were designed. But with roller bearings, the EM1s also proved their success on fast mill and express passenger trains. They were initially assigned to the Cumberland Division, which was home to the notorious Sand Patch and 17 Mile Grades. Later, when diesels started taking over that territory, the big Yellowstones were transferred to the Pittsburgh Division. By 1957, though, the B&O had started scrapping some of the EM1s. 
with all of them gone and cut up by 1960. Or were they? In the summer of 2015, a post in a BNO Facebook page showed an old Baltimore and Ohio Museum book from the late 50s and early 60s, with one of the future exhibits being an EM-1 Yellowstone. These pictures, which were also present in the post, show locomotive 659, I presume previously numbered 7609, in dead storage, awaiting the chance to be put on display. Tragically, there was a mistake in communication about the 659's status, and the locomotive didn't live to see preservation, being cut up for scrap by 1961. A case of close but no cigar for these B&O brutes. Sorry for the massive copying, Christopher. Number 11. The Southern Pacific AC-11s. Appropriate spot is appropriate. Remember the AC-9s we looked at earlier? They were nicknamed Reverse Cab Forwards, and that's not without a reason. The AC-11s here were more traditional SP articulated motive power, with the cab up front to prevent the crew choking in the smoke plumes while passing through the tunnels and snow sheds of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Heck, most of the modern AC class cab forwards were indeed pretty much Yellowstone locomotives that were permanently running in reverse, with the smoke box facing the tender. I'm actually going to give months here right now, because between November of 1942 and April of 1943, there were 30 of these locomotives built, numbered 4245 through 4274, again by Baldwin. Also, there are still a few more classes on this list with 30 examples made, so get ready. Anyway, like most other cab forwards, the AC-11s could be found in California and its neighboring states, hauling both freight and passenger trains. By the beginning of 1954, things were starting to look bleak for the AC-11s, when the withdrawal of this class began. By 1958, all were retired. Of course. The final AC-11 that was built, number 4274, was used for a final stand of steam on the Southern Pacific for a special excursion passenger train over Donner Pass. By September of 1959, all 30 of the AC-11s were scrapped, with the iconic 4274 having gone in April of the same year. But the legacy of the cap forwards will live on in the form of films about them. Among those films was the last run of the 4274, which was released on DVD by Pentrex. And of course, the cab forward legacy also lives on in the form of the sole survivor of them all, the final cab forward built AC-12, number 4294, on display at the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, California, the same town that gave us Smosh. SHUT UP! Also. Again, the cab forwards did have their air compressors on the smoke box, but since that isn't the front of these locomotives, I don't mind it so much. They could be serviced from a platform that was nicknamed the Monkey Deck. No, don't think about it, no free rides for you, Optimus Primal. Plenty of hobos have already gotten free rides at the cost of nearly becoming deaf. Maybe choking to death in the smoke plumes. Well, that's just prime. Hey there, guys. Um, sorry to interrupt uh, about halfway through here, but I decided to cut this um, massive top 20 into uh, two halves with 10 entries each. Uh, the reason for this is because this half is already about, well, 30 minutes long, and part two is uh, just over 40 minutes long. So I decided to... Um, to just cut it in half uh, right here. In fact, I started with the audio recording, uh, editing that together, you know, cutting out the bits where I fumble my words and, you know, mispronounce stuff or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. And part one, that was already about 30 minutes long. Part two, just over 40. I haven't collected any uh, images at the time, at the time I record this particular segment. But, obviously, you've just seen images in the video. And I'd, I just, uh, I will publish the halves 
separately. I won't clip them, uh, I won't uh, paste them together. So, you'll have uh, part one today, which you've just seen, and part two will be ready within a week. And so, I wish you a good morning, or a good afternoon, or a good night, depending on what time it is over there when you clicked on this video to watch it. So have a good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for watching. And part two will be ready within a week. Promise.